of the Wrestling Mayhem crew. Let your instincts go. At WrestlingMayhemShow.com What's up, guys? It's Sork here, Wrestling Mayhem Show 208, and on the line we have a very, very special guest. Of course, we've been talking to you guys about Chikara. Wrestle fans been uh, putting his uh, indie minute reports in about what's going on with them, but we're going straight to the source this week. On the line right now is the patriarch of Chikara himself, Lightning Mike Quackenbush. Did I get all your titles straight, sir? <laughs> Yes, thanks very much, and thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> Excellent. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing quite well. It's a very snowy evening here. I live in Philadelphia, and they're predicting that we're getting yet another foot of snow, so it's a perfect night to be inside. I hear that. I hear that. We're in Pittsburgh here. Of course, we're recording this on a Thursday evening, and uh, and, and there's the threat there, and we still haven't cleaned it all up from before, definitely. Yeah, exactly. So, um, well, let's get right off the bat. I mean, uh, like Shakara, we've been talking about a lot. For people that don't know what Shakara is, it's definitely something different as far as professional wrestling goes. Uh, tell us, what is Shakara, and and, uh, and why should we be checking it out? Well, uh, to try and sum it up for the uninitiated, I like to think of Shakara as something of an experiment within the pro wrestling performance genre. Um, it's the about as far removed from ideas like what you might see, uh, what I think of as like the McMahon model of sports entertainment, or even some of the slight variations. Like in my mind, TNA really kind of plays like caffeine pre WWE. <laughs> um, we tried to really take a, a distinct uh, step away from all of that. And uh, although this is sometimes very difficult to, to qualify in another way, I like to think of it as, as wrestling where the emphasis is really on the fun of it. Um, which is kind of what I cherish about the wrestling I remember growing up with. Um, to me, it seemed like it was a lot more enjoyable, whereas uh, a lot of what, and I don't watch a great deal of it, but when I do take the time to watch things like Raw or Impact, those kinds of things, I'm really struck at times by, one, the, the product strikes me as being somewhat monotonous, and two, uh, sometimes it's a little insulting to the intelligence as well. Um, obviously, when you're trying to attract a broad audience, you know, like the WWE does, you write to uh, the lowest common denominator in your audience. And uh, I think you'll find it's something entirely different at Chikara, so whether it's the presentation, the characters, um, the way things evolve in the ring, as well as our in-ring style, which is heavily influenced by Mexican Lucha Libre. Um, it's a totally different beast than what uh, you're going to find anywhere else in the American scene. Definitely, definitely. Uh, about those influences, I know, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you actually have a little bit of uh, uh, the foreign influence as far as your training as well. Is that correct? Yes, that's true. Uh, I've been very fortunate to spend some time training under a man named, known as Jorge Rivera. Um, he was a masked luchador who had a number of identities under masks. He went by Skyda most famously. He's uh, been Desteo, among other things. Um, he was probably what he's best known for is the training at Ultimo Dragon's gym. He was the head trainer there for about a decade when they were called the Toriumon. And, uh, you know, obviously a lot of those guys left then and formed the, the company now known as Dragon Gate. And uh, just a few years ago, Jorge departed uh, the Ultimo Dragon system to join with the Dragon Gate guys who had left years earlier. So that entire group of guys uh, from the Toriumon and most of the Dragon Gate guys are all his protégés. Obviously, they bring a very cutting-edge style to the ring, and uh, we at Chikara have been very lucky to have him as a guest trainer at times uh, to really bring us the true international influence, because you can certainly learn bits and pieces if you're uh, studious in your viewing, but nothing beats that first-hand training. Excellent, excellent. So, I mean, and, and of course, uh, uh, if I read correctly, uh, Chikara came from, first you were the wrestling factory, then you became Chikara. Uh, and uh, I think you were affiliated with CZW for a little bit there. Um, obviously, you know the 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 product we see on, on our DVDs and on the podcast and everything seem you know so much different uh, and stick out from everything we've seen out there. Uh, how do, how's the training? Is is the training something that people aren't going to get anywhere else for you guys over there? The training is definitely a unique aspect of what makes Chikara different. In that, as far as I know, uh, anywhere in the United States. Uh, you're not going to find such a diverse curriculum uh, other than at Shakara Wrestle Factory because we are teaching like that almost obsolete British style. We teach Mexican mm -hmm. Lucha Libre. We teach Japanese style. So you're not just getting American with maybe another little influence here or there. Um, but we're trying to uh, make sure that our students and trainees are the most well-rounded guys. And I think that's really been the success of the program. 
uh, because we're able to send our trainees, even some of the newest guys fresh out of the wrestle factory, we can send them on the road, they can travel, and they can go anywhere. Uh, they can work any style. You know, if we want to send them, spend a couple of weeks down in Mexico, they adapt uh, very, very readily uh, to those kinds of circumstances. And between that and the fact that our, our characters tend to be very colorful and larger than life and memorable, um, it really ends up meaning that a lot of Chikara talent very in demand, not just in the American circuit, but around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, what... I, I think there's a there's a there's a stigma of of uh, people that maybe won't check out Chikara because the first thing they see is the people with the colorful uh, costumes and and the different styles. Um, what what would you say that the people that that uh, that uh, that that they should t- check it out? I see. Um, well, yes, I, I think that's a valid point. Mm-hmm. I've, I've certainly in my travels come across that, or you know, I get emails and things like that from fans who say. They see something, uh, you know, a snippet of Chikara here or there, and something about it turns them off. Um, you know, perhaps it's the, the sensibility or the sense of humor about it or, or, or the style of characters, and they're just, um, they immediately use that small bit of it to characterize the entire company. Um, Chikara are the multi-faceted creatures, you know. There's a lot more to it than a funny clip you may have seen of Dragon Dragon online. There's more mm-hmm. to it than guys like Lowe's Ice Cream. Um, and you really do have to look deeper in it, I think, to see, you know, how many different facets there are to what we do. But uh, it's very easy. I think, like I said, I think it's a valid point that sometimes people will try to characterize the whole company based on a 30-second clip they see online. <laughs> Excellent. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and uh, through some of these fan questions here. Uh, a wrestle fan also asked, and we we mentioned about your about your training and everything. He says you've wrestled all across, across the world in your story career. Uh, what's been your favorite country to work in thus far? I really enjoy wrestling in Germany. Mm-hmm. Killer. Um, they have really passionate, knowledgeable fans there. That uh, they, they love their wrestling, and they love all styles of wrestling. Um, some of the other places I've gone, the, the crowd is very reserved or... Uh, you know, sometimes you, they just can't overcome the idea of a foreigner uh, being there. But I've mm-hmm. always found it very difficult to wrestle in Germany. And I think probably if I had to add them up, uh, all my different international appearances and everything else, I probably wrestled the most times in the country of Germany outside of the U.S. Excellent, excellent. Um, he also asks, uh, uh, what's been your worst injury in your career? Of course, you've you've been around for uh, over 10 years, correct? That's true. Uh, the first uh, real match I had to, to speak of which took place on May 20th, 1994. So, oh, wow. Um, very soon here, I'm coming up on uh, closing my 16th year. Um, so I've, I've, I've had my fair share. I, I think probably the most... That's tough. Uh, there are two particularly harrowing experiences that I've had. <laughs> um, so uh, one of which was... and. and very, very early on. I want to say this, this was maybe March of 1995. Mm-hmm. In an effort to uh, perform a double team move uh, with my then partner, I was doing a split-legged moonsault on the corner, and I came back, unfortunately, in the back of my skull, collided with my partner's kneecap, and uh, I fractured my skull, and all had a seizure in the thing, and it had to be taken out on life support. Um, so that, that, of course, is a rather serious one. But in terms of, like, gore factor or something else, um, in 1999, I was wrestling in a rodeo ring in Texas, uh, in Nacogdoches, Texas, if memory serves. And uh, I was uh, flipping out of the ring like a moonsault, and uh, the man I was <laughs> attempting to hit, I did. But I, I caught more of uh, the floor than I caught of him. And unfortunately, uh, there was a spike that had turned up through the dirt um, because of the shifting of the ring. And it caught me in the forehead and ripped my scalp open back uh, behind my ear. So uh, I, was, I was knocked out from this, from, from falling on my head, of course. And uh, because it was mud, you know, it was dirt, it became mud as I bled profusely all over the place. <laughs> By the time I got to the back, uh, I was, like, covered in this bloody mud. And, it was, you know, it was obviously very disgusting. But uh, I, uh, I was really knocked stupid. And... Uh, I, I had no idea. You know, people were saying, you, you really need to go to the hospital. And I'm saying, no, of course not. I will be the hospital. I'm perfectly fine. And uh, a, fr- a friend of mine who wrestled in ECW under the name Julio De Niro happened to be there. And he came over to me and he said, uh, you should really go look at yourself in the mirror. I don't think you realize, like, the condition that you're in. So I went over and I looked, and of course, you know, it was bloody and muddy and gross. And I moved some uh, hair away 
front from in front of my face, and in doing so, I pulled the flap of skin that I had sliced um, away. I actually, for a second, saw my skull. Um, and uh, I, I it, in terms of like the overall effect and stuff, that was nowhere near as as bad as the fracturing of my skull. It's a better story. Um, <laughs> get a much more, a more visceral reaction to telling the story of slicing your scalp open. Um, so that was definitely the grossest of the injuries. Um, so there you go. There's a good sampling. I ask, uh, you talked a little bit about about the moves. You know, I, I've seen uh, some great you know clips and and, and videos. Uh, uh, you have a very, a very airborne style, a very, a uh, very fast paced style. Uh, was that, uh, more product of your training or was that kind of what you were, uh, uh, expected to do when, when you decided to get into wrestling? Uh, you know, where, where, where did the roots of your, I don't, I don't have any of the words other than crazy style. <laughs> um, well, it was certainly at the time, I mean, my style evolved a lot over the years mm-hmm. in the nineties. I used to watch a lot of the Japanese junior heavyweights, and that was the style I wanted to emulate the most. And uh, certainly, when I started out in the mid-90s, I was always the smallest guy on every independent show. So that style was kind of expected of me. Like, uh, that that was what I was booked to do. I was supposed to be the crazy high flyer kid. That was the only use that little guys of me had. Of course, uh, now here we are, 15, 16 years removed from that. A lot of the locker rooms I walk into, I'm one of the biggest guys, so... Um, the status quo has really changed, and so too has, you know, what passes for crazy high flying. You know, I see things all the time now, even out of some of my own trainees that I couldn't, my, my body simply couldn't do, you know, the, uh, the amount of control that they have over themselves while flying through the air and that sort of thing. And, um, like at a, at the time, you know, which is in the mid 90s or so, I think people probably thought of me as having a very cutting edge style on, on the independence, whereas uh, today there's certainly Dozens and dozens and dozens of guys whose high flying capabilities far surpass my own, um, and and I've had to adapt my style as well. You know, uh, mm-hmm. that takes a real toll on your body to go out and do that. Uh, independent guys do every single weekend, so uh, you know I've had to adapt as well. Definitely. Is there is there, is there anything that uh, you can't pull off these days that you wish you could? Uh, no, nothing immediately springs to mind. Mm-hmm. Like. The guys that I train with always kind of like to poke fun because uh, sometimes during training sessions they'll say, "Why don't you show us that thing that you used to do, whatever that might be?" And it's like, I can't do that anymore, guys. Yeah, yeah. But then they nag me and nag me, and then the reality is I can. Like I, I don't know if it's just because uh, like I have it in my head that I can't do the the stuff anymore that I used to do when I was 19 years old. I don't know. Um, but yeah, invariably, whenever they pester me, uh, it turns out I, I probably could. I probably do a lot of those those crazy things that I used to do. But, um, you know, I see a lot of the more modern stuff that's out there, and you know, a lot of that is is beyond my ability. So, excellent, excellent. Um, and going going back to the fan questions, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about about your beginning. Uh, Sean Brayfield uh, asks, "What did it feel like uh, walking into the ring the first time?" The very first time I walked into the ring. Wow. Uh, <laughs> There's, well, there's kind of two different experiences. Uh, the first time that I, I worked for um, an, a, a group where, you know, I was hired to come in more or less, or I was I was picked really because someone failed to show up mm-hmm. and was, was put on, um, that was so unbelievably thrilling because I had spent my time, I mean, I, I got in a very backwards way. You know, I was kind of the guy that would show up and help set the chairs or that sort of a thing. And I had my duffel bag with my awful homemade costume and hoping that, Someday someone wouldn't show up, and the promoter would come over to me and say, "Hey, you're on," which is not really the way to go about doing things. Like, point if you're an aspiring pro wrestler, really foolhardy course to traverse. Um, but that's the way I went about it when I was trying to get independent booking. So, well, on that particular day, I was working. Uh, the show was in a barn in uh, Uniontown, West Virginia, <laughs> and um, the promoter who, who was. Uh, lovingly referred to as a five dollar sal that may clue you in as to the rate at which he paid professionals. Uh he came up to me and said, you know, somebody's not here, do you have your do you have your stuff? And of course I did. You know, I've been waiting. Thank God he finally came to me and asked me that question. And uh I was just like bristling with excitement. Like I couldn't believe it was finally gonna happen. And, uh, it was just such a thrill just to be in the locker room was really a thrill. But um, when I finally stepped foot in the ring and it was a really strange experience because I, up until that moment, I had not encountered the guy who I was wrestling against. 
um, who did a giant hillbilly gimmick. He was a man uh, who went by the name of Man Mountain Chris. Um, and unfortunately, as, as I came to discover, it was also hearing impaired, which is an unusual thing to come across in the world of best wrestling. Um, so, of course, then I was party to four of the most awful minutes of wrestling that anyone ever watched before. <laughs> Man Mountain Chris just uh, you know, quickly wrapped things up. And, uh, you know, at the time, I weighed about 160 pounds, so it was not much of a match. For him, but uh, it was just like overwhelmingly exciting. Um, every every bit of it to get to, to go into the locker room and to suit up and you know for at the time of course I had like a cassette tape with my song on it to hear that <laughs> play and to come out through the you know the, the patch barn in Uniontown. It was it was really quite exciting. Awesome, awesome. Um, and speaking of which, uh, and then WrestleFan also asks, uh, is the Chikara Chikara locker room any different than the locker rooms uh, that you that you've seen in other promotions? Very much so. Uh, uh, I find often by our, our guests and visitors that uh, the atmosphere is very, very different. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, th- I think one of the greatest compliments uh, I think Chikara as a whole has ever really paid. A couple of years ago, we had uh, Demolition Axe and Smash uh, made a guest appearance at one of our giant King of Trios events. Uh, and what was also they had remarked, uh, I was there and uh, a couple of our other guys who. Uh, shoulder a lot of the backstage responsibilities were kind of there uh and they remarked to us they said you know everywhere we go uh no one treats us as well as you guys did and there are a lot of companies that could really learn from the example you set about the way you conduct your business in your locker room and, uh from guys who are to me of legendary stature you know i remember sitting in front of the television and uh you know just as a fan and uh, being so excited when that, that demolition song, that Rick Derringer song, <laughs> came on the TV and they would come marching out in that uh, crazy, whatever that was supposed to be, S&M dominatrix gear. I don't know. You look back on those diamond studded diapers and you think, what were you going for, Ben McMahon? Whatever that was that they were supposed to be, like, oh, that was so cool. And, well, here they were. And, you know, they they were so complimentary and they were so professional and so much fun to work with. And, um I, I, I think overall, it was really one of the nice compliments we've been paid, and it really said a lot about, um, you know, the way the atmosphere is very different. That it's, um, it, there's, there's nothing cut through that. They're only going places, even in the last couple of years, where the locker rooms are very political and they're very cutthroat, and you say something to someone and they turn right around and, you know, the guys say this to somebody else and they're going to use that to get ahead of you or to, to stab you in the back. And um, I, I never had a taste for that type of, like, political maneuvering. Um, a couple, a couple of my friends who work in TNA had often remarked to me, they said, you know, uh, we'll, we'll never be able to get into one of the top spots because we're not as good as poli- at politicking as some of the other guys here. And I could relate to what they were saying because even at the independent level, as absurd as that might seem, mm-hmm. um, I, I've always been astonished to see the level to which people will try to politic their way up, up the ladder. And, um, I don't know. I, I, I Especially at the independent level, there's so there's so little to bicker over. Who could imagine <laughs> that you would need to to do that type of politics? And yet I've seen it firsthand. So it's like I, a, I, I, I'm sorry. So it's like everybody's just just feeding for the scraps that that are out there in independence. Then yeah, that's a very good way of phrasing it. And, uh, it's kind of I don't know. Oh. Like it uh, has a pathetic overtone to me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, again, talking about the school wrestle fan ass, uh, is there anybody coming out of there that, uh, you think is going to make a big impact, uh, coming up? Uh, well, wow, that's, that's, uh, or, or maybe, or maybe young, young, young on the roster, maybe. You know, I, the truth of the matter is there's no one that uh, really graduates out of the program onto the Chikara roster before they're ready. Okay. And, um, there's there's really no one that gets to that point unless we really feel like you know these they're ready and and there's no one whose potential I would underestimate. Um, I think for example, if maybe you look back over the last I'm just guessing ten or twelve graduates to come out of the wrestle factory. One of the easiest guys to overlook uh, is is a guy that uh, is known as Frightmare. Uh, he's one of the smallest guys we ever had on our roster. And uh, the reality of the matter is, you know, of course, you can't judge a book by his cover. Uh, he went on just this past year in the Observer 2009 Year End Awards, winning Rookie of the Year. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, like I said, you can't judge a book by its cover. And maybe we'd look at the last uh, dozen or so graduates to come out and 
people might think, oh, I can just take a look and I can pick who's going to be a star or who's going to who's going to do well or, or or do this kind of thing. And you never really know. Um, and he's a fine example of that. Is right there. Excellent, excellent. Uh, well, I, I do want to talk a little bit about Chikar and some stuff coming up. But first, I want to talk about, of course, you mentioned before, uh, Dragon, Dragon Gate USA, uh, who's got a pay-per-view coming up March 5th, and I do believe you have a match on there. Yes, that's right. Uh, in fact, as a tag team match, you'll see my regular partner and, in fact, a trainee of mine, Jigsaw. We team together to take on a rather star-studded team. We take on the Luchador Super Crazy and uh, really the icon, the, the face of Dragon Gate, uh, Shima, uh, the, you know, most famous breakout star of that company. So, and that, uh, you can see the tag match, well, there's a ton of other matches with Turtle, screaming about them being match of the year candidates and all that kind of stuff that they seem to do after every Dragon Gate USA <laughs> pay-per-view. Um, they're always chock full of really exciting, um, and rem- matches of remarkable quality. Uh, they just have, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to put it without sounding overly superlative. They just have an outrageous <laughs> talent pool, uh, and I feel very lucky to be included in that. So, uh, and, and, and they're for, always something special. For listeners of the show, I want to make sure it's not confused. That's not Shima Zion uh, that we've talked about and re- interviewed here. No, Shima Zion. They, uh, Shima Zion, of course, his name is spelled S H I I M A. Yes. For many, many years, the, 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 the Japanese wrestler who's called the Shima, I thought it was pronounced. Shima, C-I-M-A. Mm-hmm. Uh, I only found out a, a little while ago that he pronounces it Shima. Now, his given name is Shima Nobunaga, and that's where he gets it from. But based on the spelling, which is C-I-M-A, you might think it is Shima, as I did for quite a few years. But um, he's Shima as well. He's just not Shima Zaya. <laughs> now, now uh, Dragon's Gate is, uh, is something different. Again, uh, um, uh, Gabe... Uh, Gabe, that used to do uh, the the Ring of Honor booking, is it's his promotion, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um, it, it looks like it's an interesting mix of the Japanese and the U.S. Uh, uh, stars. Um, I mean, how how is it to, uh, to 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 work with these people that they're bringing in? Well, Dragon Gate USA, it is a, an American offshoot of the Japanese office. Okay. Um, it's overseen by uh, Mr. O.G., uh, who operates the Dragon Gate USA office, which is based in Texas. But uh, obviously, uh, uh, Gabe is instrumental in putting the cards together. And it is. It's a really interesting melting pot. Um, and I, I've been very lucky in that, you know, I've, I've had the chance to wrestle against uh, kind of a, a mix of, mm-hmm. of the talent that have, has come through Dragon Gate USA. So, it's, it's, of course, it's very exciting because if you pay any attention to what the Dragon Gate guys do in Japan, um, you realize these guys are probably the hardest working troop of wrestlers out there. Uh, in an average year, they do 250 live events, um, which is outrageous when you consider the style that they wrestle, which is incredibly fast paced, incredibly high impact. It's cutting edge. Um, you know, you might think to yourself, well, that's, you know, if you look at how many total shows the WWE puts on in a year, you might think, oh, well, you know, that, that number isn't necessarily blow away. But, of course, there's some radical differences in the style that you're going to see, uh, you know, the WWE guys doing versus the Dragon Gate guys doing. And uh, they, they put themselves through incredible amounts of conditioning um, and, and training as well. You know, they, they are precision wrestlers. They take uh, great pride in being perfectionist in the ring. And of course, it only makes you want to up your game being around guys of such a high caliber because you think, if I don't, these guys are just going to outclass me, so... Uh, it's a great experience to be around those guys. Excellent, excellent. And now uh, I, I want to talk about an event that's coming up. Uh, one of the big reasons we wanted to get you on to talk about, of course, us here on the Mayhem Show. We're from the Pittsburgh area. We are taking the trip out to Philadelphia. Uh, a few of us were looking to see firsthand the King of Trios tournament. Uh, we're very excited about. Uh, can you tell us about King of Trios? I'd be happy to tell you about King of <laughs> Trios. If you haven't heard, it is the largest tournament in professional wrestling. It's 48 wrestlers all gathered together for one weekend. Uh, there's no other tournament that has that many participants in it that we know of. And uh, this is the fourth iteration of the tournament. Uh, we did it in 2007, 8, and 9, and this will be the fourth annual King of Trios. Uh, already about half the teams have been announced. Uh, you can find out everything there is pertaining to that tournament by going to kingoftrios.com, uh, which is the mini site uh, that encompasses everything relating to it. It is the biggest event on our annual calendar. 
And as mentioned, it's three days long. It's a Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday afternoon. And uh, it has provided, you know, in the past, uh, I'd say five of the six biggest crowds we have ever drawn wow. uh, in Shikara history. It's always a, a wide and wacky cross-section. You you will definitely see uh, some of that kind of area, and you'll certainly see them in common. They won't see anywhere else. Um, some of the real highlights from last year, I thought, uh, we're getting together, in particular, uh, the British wrestling legend Johnny Saint, the team with a man who in many ways is sort of his uh, equivalent, uh, Jorge Rivera, as I mentioned, Luchador, who uh, was instrumental in my training. Um, just uh, being able to team with two of those guys, see them uh, in the ring together was something unique in and of itself. And that was just one of, of many, many, many uh, unique almost oddities in the world of wrestling that came together for King of Trio. So um, in the independent landscape, there's certainly nothing quite like it out there, and I'm sure you will not be disappointed. That's April 23rd, 24th, and 25th at the former ECW Arena in South Philadelphia. Excellent, excellent. And now, if anybody wants to check out Chikara, and, and this is how I've been able to dip my toe in the, in the promotion as well, uh, you guys have a podcast, which I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, on a weekly basis here for a while. You just celebrated your 200th episode out there. That is right, yes. In, in fact, one of the easiest ways to get on board with what's going on with Chikara, you can through the iTunes store or on uh, you know internet outlets like YouTube or Flip TV, uh, mm-hmm. you can access Chikara Podcast to go-go. And as mentioned, uh, we're now uh, on episode 201. It's been a long, strange journey. Um, it features news about what, what we're up to and clips from our matches as well. So if you're looking for a free sampling of what it is we do at Chikara, there's no better way to get on board than with our weekly roughly nine minutes, usually times out around, um, video podcast. That's Chikara Podcast to go And we also uh, we are in the first phase of launching a new project of ours to make everything Chikara a little more accessible to new fans who are just discovering us now and want to get in on the ground floor. I invite you to check out Chikara101.com. That's the beginner's course, to be sure. Uh, and more things will be developing over at Chikara101.com in the next month or two as the other parts of that project come to light. But that's a great starting point if you're new to the Chikara microcosm. Excellent. Excellent. And, and, and uh, another thing I, I noticed um, just recently on your, on your podcast you've been promoting, uh, you can actually pick up Chikara events on, uh, I, I guess it's a pay-per-view basis, correct? Uh, you can stream them, yes, that's true. If uh, buying uh, physical DVDs is uh, not your cup of tea, you can stream our events directly onto your computer. You have access to them for a period of usually like two or three weeks, and uh, that is at Hybrid Entertainment TV. You'll find links to that on ShikaraPro.com. They have uh, at least the back half of our 2009 catalog uh, readily accessible to you there. So if that's your style, you can uh, check it out that way via Hybrid Entertainment TV. I was, I was very impressed. It's got a, a great uh, selection. Of course, you guys, CZW, Evolve. Uh, I definitely recommend people checking that out. It looks like it might be a wave of the future, so to speak. <laughs> so We try to stay at the forefront of those emerging technologies so mm-hmm. that uh, you know, we never seem like we're too far behind the time. Uh, yeah, you definitely seem like you're you're the most kind of forward thinking uh, as far as uh, as far as the technology, the delivery, the the reaching out to new fans, social media on the internet that I've seen. Um, I mean, is that? Uh, well, of course, you know, you're two, what, probably, what four years in on on the uh, podcast, being two hundred in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, uh, when did when did the big push on the technology come in your in your you know ten year history with the company? Yeah, I mean that's. That's really always kind of been the, the theme is that we wanted to be at, at the forefront of that. We never wanted mm-hmm. to trail behind. And, um, you know, as, as we used to kind of joke around, we used to say, eventually there's going to be a technology where wrestling matches will be beamed directly into your brain. And we want to be sure we're the first ones being sent into people's brains. Um, we always want to stay at the forefront of that because that, that keeps the audience fresh. And mm-hmm. uh, because we're specifically designed for younger audiences, we feel like that's the best way to reach them. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys from the old guard that think things like having your show on a cable access channel means you've made it in the world of wrestling. It's 2010, like that kind of stuff just isn't relevant anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, there's all kinds of new ways to reach fans and, uh, the, the metrics by which the level have totally been revolutionized by the internet. And, uh, you really need to stay on top of that kind of thing if you want to stay in touch. Definitely. Definitely. Um, well, uh, 
don't want to keep you all night, of course. Uh, uh, one, one last question from our fans, uh, then we'll, uh, then we'll close out here. Uh, what, what is your dream match from Sean Brayfield? Uh, if you were to meet, and, and a little bit mixed from WrestleFan too, if you wanted, wanted to wrestle anybody living or dead, what would your pick be, sir? Yeah, I think it would be really interesting to wrestle the original Tiger Mask when he was in his prime, mm-hmm. you know, like 1982. Um, just because I, that springs to mind, of course, because, you know, such a thing is impossible. A lot of the guys that I would love to be able to uh, be across the ring from, it's still quite possible, you know, guys like Jushin Liger haven't retired. I would love to have a singles match with Christopher Daniel. Um, but in terms of, like, an unrealistic dream like that, I think, how fascinating it might be to match up with a, in his prime, Toru Sayama. There is truly no one like him, and there probably never will be again. So maybe in the future, if there's a Legends of Chikara game, we might see it happen. <laughs> Quite possibly. Um, well, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Mike Quackenbush, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure talking to you tonight. Please check him out, ChikaraPro.com. I believe it's GG, DGAUSA. Dot TV for Dragon's Gate. We'll have all those links on the website, of course. Uh, anything else coming up you you want people to know about? Well, I think we just about covered it, right? We've got that <laughs> Chikara podcast, Chikara101.com, Kingoftrios.com. If you visit those, you'll be up to snuff right away with everything going on in Chikara. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, we hope to speak to you sometime in the future. Uh, we'll see you in uh, Philadelphia for King of Trios. And, uh, and, and uh, thanks very much. Right, I'll see you there. Thank you. All right. Well, there you go. Lightning Mike Crackenbush, our uh, talk with him from late last week. Uh, did you enjoy that, DJ Lunchbox? That was fantastic. Fantastic. Lightning Mike Quackenbush, a class act. And it's a pleasure to have him here on the Wrestling Mayhem Show. 